Um, as many of you know, in the, in the three years since taking office, um, President Obama and his administration have done significant things to ensure safety, justice, equality, and dignity for LGBT people. From passing the Hate Crimes Prevention Act to repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we've seen time and time again the President honor his commitment to our community. And as many of you know, we've also benefited from a number of other uh, incredibly important actions that make a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of LGBT people, like rules and regulations to prohibit discrimination and expand the government's understanding of what, means, what, what we mean when we say family. And many of those things you'll hear about later today. But as you all know, the hard work doesn't end with a memo or an announcement or the launch of a program. In fact, that's really where the hard work begins. Implementation is key. Education and training are critical. And your feedback is absolutely invaluable. So that's why we're here today as part of this conference. Uh, the goal of these conferences that we're having across the country, the goal of these conferences is to empower advocates and organizations and interested members of the public with information, resources, and opportunities that the Obama administration has to offer. And we want to learn from you. So we want you to tell us what's working, what's not working, and what we can do better. We want to know about the challenges and obstacles that you face. And if you're successful in your work, we want to hear about innovation, and we want to hear about best practices. And chances are, most of the other people in this room would want to hear about those things, too. So here's how the day is going to work. This morning, in just a few minutes, you will hear from senior members of the Obama administration and from national advocates working in LGBT youth homelessness. From 12.30 to 2 o'clock PM, we will break for lunch and open space meetings. And just a word about these open space meetings. The purpose of this time is to give you a chance to identify an issue, a topic, or a project that's important to you, and to organize around it with other like-minded folks. So this is your chance to set the agenda and explore issues that aren't being addressed elsewhere in the conference. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that at our next break. Uh, after lunch, we will reconvene in the McGregor Center, which is right over there. It's attached by a breezeway. Uh, for workshop sessions on key issues related to housing and homelessness. And this is a chance for you to exchange information and ideas uh, with other folks in the room, as well as with Obama administration officials. And finally, at the end of the day, we will reconvene here for a closing session with some very special guests. So it's uh, quite a day we have lined up for you. And before I get started, I just wanted to say thank you so much and acknowledge the community leaders who helped make this day possible. Um, to Denise and Nusrat from Equality Michigan, thank you so much for your help and your leadership uh, here in the state. Um, to Curtis from Kick, uh, thank you for your support and guidance as well. And especially to Lori Hughes from the Ruth, Ruth Ellis Center and to your board members, John Allen and Brian Hoffman, many, many, many thanks for your partnership in this whole effort. So to all of you, thank you for your courage and commitment to equality, uh, the, the commitment you, just, you, you uh, demonstrate every single day. Your leadership truly sets an example for all of us in DC as well, so thank you. Um, uh, finally, a few quick housekeeping uh, tips and tricks. Uh, first, please note that this morning's session is open to the press, most of whom are uh, with us in the back, but that the afternoon uh, workshop sessions are closed press. For photographers, um, please feel free to take photos of what's happening on stage, but we do ask that you respect the privacy of audience members and not take photographs of the audience. Finally, you're all welcome to tweet along um, using the hashtag uh, WHLGBT. It's on your agenda and the Twitter handles that are also listed there. So with that, uh, we're ready to get things started, and it's my pleasure to start by introducing someone who I know is a familiar face to many of you, Detroit's very own City Council President, Charles Pugh. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that uh, I am proud that we are having this uh, most important conversation uh, here in the city of Detroit. Uh, as a uh, proud member of Detroit's LGBT community and the first ever openly gay elected official in Detroit's history, uh, I know the significance uh, of this topic. Uh, too often, our young people are victimized uh, in their own homes, verbally, physically, uh, and therefore have to leave uh, on their own because they don't feel comfortable. Uh, in their own space, the space where they should be protected the most, or they are kicked out uh, because of their orientation. Uh, we are very blessed uh, in the city of Detroit uh, to have uh, one of the nation's uh, premier uh, institutions that really focus on uh, our young people uh, and their safety, their development, but also housing uh, of young people who don't have any safe place to go. So I welcome uh, this conversation. I appreciate uh, the members of the Obama administration who are here 
uh, to shed some light on a topic that is uh, difficult to talk about um, and really doesn't have a lot of conversations um, about to focus resources, uh, to bring attention, uh, to save our young people. Because we know that oftentimes, unfortunately, it is a downward spiral um, once young people are disconnected uh, from where young people should be, and that's around a loving family and pushing them uh, toward an education and becoming a productive citizen. So I appreciate um, this dialogue. Uh, I look forward to some tangible, measurable results and outcomes and hopefully best practices that, that we can continue here. Uh, so I, I thank you for being here. Um, my office uh, is always um, interested in joining efforts, um, championing efforts, starting efforts. Um, to protect our young people. So thank you again. Welcome to the wonderful city of Detroit. Uh, most of you uh, have uh, been here uh, before. Uh, sorry it's so cold. We've had some 50 and 60 degree weather. I don't know what happened today, but uh, I guess it still is winter. At any rate, welcome and thank you. And um, as I mentioned, we've had a very warm welcome here in Detroit, and we've had a, an especially warm welcome from the folks here at Wayne State. So next, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Patrick Lindsay, who's the Vice President for Government and Community Affairs here at Wayne State. And again, thank him and the leadership here for having us. Good morning. Welcome to Wayne State. We are delighted to have all of you here this morning. We certainly are delighted to host Secretary Donovan and certainly glad to have also in our midst other administration officials, U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid and City Council President Charles Pugh, the officials of the Ruth Ellis Center, but mostly you all, the attendees of this conference, we welcome you to our home, uh, Wayne State, we're a place where ideas are discussed. It's a forum of learning and sharing. It is a seat of exchange of different viewpoints and perspectives. And today, we hope that you find our home a place to discuss a very important issue in this community, a growing concern, and that is homelessness, particularly among the LGBT community. And so we're delighted to host this forum. You know, I recall growing up, uh, one of my favorite movies was Wizard of Oz. Okay, I admit it. Uh, but Dorothy, you know, when she clicked her th heels three times, she said, there's no place like home. But unfortunately, too many people in our community don't have a place that they can call home. And it's not just bricks and mortar, it's a place where you can feel loved, a place where you can feel secure, a place where you can grow and be nurtured, love and be loved. And so we hope that this conference will help to solve some of the issues that are facing our community. And hopefully this exchange of ideas will not end at the end of the session. So again, on behalf of President Alan Gilmore, the Board of Governors, and the administration here at Wayne State, Welcome to our home. So thank you again to uh, all the folks here at Wayne State for having us. And please help yourself to the delicious continental breakfast out front. Um, with that, we're ready to move forward. And to introduce Secretary Donovan, I'd like to welcome to the stage someone who I know many of you know and admire. And that's uh, Laura Hughes, the Executive Director of the Ruth Ellis Center. Good morning. On behalf of the Board of Directors, the staff, and the youth at the Ruth Ellis Center, I am thrilled to be here. I know that we are here because President Obama and his administration believe all LGBT Americans deserve a place at the table and also a place to call home. It is my honor to introduce the Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, Sean Donovan. HUD has been the leading government agency 
working to advance LGBT equality. While at the helm of HUD, Secretary Donovan has worked for three years to ensure housing programs are open not to just some, not to most, but to all. Some examples. For the first time ever at the National Fair Housing Policy Conference, HUD hosted a session on housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. HUD implemented the new equal access rule, banning owners and operators of HUD-funded and HUD-insured housing from inquiring about applicants' sexual orientation and gender identity or discriminating on that basis. It also bans discrimination in HUD's voucher programs and Fair Housing Act lending decisions for mortgage insurance. And while Michigan shamefully currently lacks anti-discrimination laws that include sexual orientation and gender identity, we applaud HUD for requiring grant applicants to comply with such laws in the 20 states that have them. As Secretary Donovan said in his speech at the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force Creating Change Conference earlier this year, there are no sidelines in this fight. To build an America where all LGBT people have access to shelter and support, all of us who are committed to that cause must work together. Secretary Donovan has already shown great leadership in this regard, and this conference will continue our movement forward. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Donovan. Thank you. Thank you all for that warm welcome. Laura, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, very kind. Uh, but more importantly, thank you for your leadership of the Ruth Ellis Center. The work of this organization, is, as you all know, is absolutely remarkable. It's one of only four agencies in the entire country that's dedicated to runaway and homeless lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender youth. And you, Laura, are an inspiration to all of us that are fighting for equality for the LGBT community. So let's give Laura and the Ruth Ellis Center a big round of applause. I also want to recognize and thank all of my colleagues and friends from HUD and other federal agencies for their unbelievable leadership on, uh, on all of the issues that affect LGBT Americans. Uh, I also have to say to Gautam Raghavan, who, uh, from the White House Office of Public Env Engagement, uh, who has, without whom this conference would never have been possible, but more importantly, so many of the advances uh, that we've made under this administration would not have been possible. Uh, thank you, Gautam, for your leadership as well. Now, I know that my, my good friend, Secretary Kathleen Sebelius, spoke to the first of these White House LGBT conferences last month. And it is a privilege uh, to be second in line uh, for me to join you today to tell you about what HUD is doing to ensure that every LGBT American not only has a seat at the table, but a place to call home. Of course, this work takes place, though, in a broader context, one where President Obama views the fight for LGBT equality not as an issue, but as a priority. You can see this commitment in the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. In his first State of the Union, the President called for its repeal. And earlier this year, at the President's third State of the Union, an active duty Air Force Colonel who is openly lesbian sat as a guest in the First Lady's box without fear of being discharged for who she is or who she loves. You can also see that commitment in a record number of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender appointments to positions throughout the administration. You can see it in the Presidential Memorandum on Hospital Visitation, which addressed the rights of patients in hospitals that receive Medicare or Medicaid funds. Just about every hospital is included there. They need to designate vis visitors regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, and directed the Secretary of Health and Human Services to take the necessary steps to improve the health and well-being of LGBT people and their families. You can see it in the efforts we've undertaken on behalf of the transgender community, from the State Department's efforts to ensure greater dignity and privacy for transgender passport applicants, 
to the Office of Personnel Management's announcement that gender identity is a prohibited basis of discrimination in federal employment, to the VA's directive to ensure respectful and non-discriminatory care for transgender veterans who deserve our deepest gratitude and our commitment to their well-being. And that commitment to the LGBT community doesn't stop at our borders. You can also see it in a presidential memorandum promoting the protection of the human rights of LGBT individuals abroad and in Secretary of State Clinton's bold and forceful declaration that gay rights are human rights and that all people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. Perhaps clearest of all, you can see the President's commitment in the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. hate crimes prevention law. I'm proud to work for the President who signed the first federal civil rights legislation that included the words sexual orientation and gender identity into the law of the United States of America. But as you all know, for all this progress, real challenges lie ahead. Each of us here knows that rights most folks take for granted are routinely violated against LGBT people. Take the story of Mitch and Michelle DeShane. Two years ago, Michelle wanted to add her partner Mitch, a transgender man, to the housing voucher she receives to find affordable housing. The local housing authority denied her request. They told her that the couple did not meet its definition of family. Then, the DeShanes were referred to a neighboring housing authority because, as they were apparently told, and I quote here, that housing authority accepts everyone, even Martians. That is just wrong. No one should be subject to that kind of treatment or denied access to housing assistance because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. But these challenges are all too common. And most heartbreaking of all, they're often faced by LGBT youth. And no challenge, no housing challenge, is as profound as homelessness. Think about it. At the time in life when most young people are worried about which college they're going to go to, what their first job might look like, what opportunities exist once they graduate from high school, thousands of gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender teenagers are worried about something far more basic, where they might be able to sleep at night, and whether they'll be safe once they get there. The numbers are staggering, despite estimates that about 7% of all American young people are gay or transgender. One recent report found that fully 40% of homeless youth are LGBT. Half of them re report experiencing homelessness as a result of their gender identity or expression. Young people thrown out of their homes and communities and often facing harassment and intimidation when they try to go to school. This tragedy continues for kids living on the streets. LGBT youth experience more acts of sexual violence, are more at risk for conditions like post-traumatic stress disorder, and are more likely to become depressed than their heterosexual counterparts. Perhaps most troubling of all, the majority of young people surveyed report harassment, difficulty, or even sexual assault when trying to access homeless shelters, the very places where they should start to feel safe. Allowing this to happen is not only wrong, it's not who we are as Americans. All of us, regardless of sexual orientation, race, gender, or gender identity, deserve a place to call home. And with your partnership, the Obama administration is working to ensure that every American has the opportunity to do just that. Whether it's preventing and ending homelessness or ensuring that federally assisted housing programs are free from discrimination. Indeed, thanks to President Obama's Recovery Act, we've already saved more than 1.2 million people from homelessness, even in the wake of the worst recession since the Great Depression. Under the Hearth Act that the President signed into law, we're expanding our definition of homelessness 
to include unaccompanied youth under 25 years old, allowing more LGBT young people to qualify for assistance under federal housing and homelessness programs. It's a commitment that goes beyond our work to end homelessness. Indeed, we're working to ensure that HUD's housing programs are open, not to some, not to most, but open to all. That's why for the first time at our annual National Fair Housing uh, Policy Conference, HUD hosted a session on housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. It's why last year HUD and HHS held the first ever LGBT Elder Housing Summit, bringing together advocates and practitioners from across the country to highlight existing barriers and explore future opportunities to support housing and long-term care designed for seniors in the LGBT community. Perhaps most important of all, it's why we're conducting the first ever national study of LGBT housing discrimination, a historic and important study we designed based on feedback from town halls conducted in communities across the country. Led by HUD Assistant Secretary Rafael Bostic, who is here with us today, this study is partly about getting a clearer picture of the problem. But it's also about making the case, the case that LGBT discrimination is real and that we need to do something about it. That's why we've been reviewing our existing authority to address housing discrimination related to the LGBT community. For instance, under the Fair Housing Act, prohibition of sex discrimination, uh, we have authority to pursue cases alleging housing discrimination because a person's identity or expression didn't conform with gender stereotypes. And we've provided HUD staff with guidance instructing them to carefully assess whether any LGBT-based housing discrimination complaints could be pursued through the Fair Housing Act or state or local discrimination laws. And we've launched a web, a web page on LGBT housing discrimination. We know that these efforts are already having an impact. With these resources, we're helping uncover discrimination that's gone unreported for far too long. And we're raising awareness that reporting such discrimination can actually make a difference. As a result, not only have reports of LGBT housing discrimination increased, so have the number of complaints that we've been able to move forward on. Just as we're making sure we know when LGBT Americans are facing discrimination, we're also making sure that LGBT Americans understand their rights. With HUD's Live Free Fair Housing Education and Outreach Campaign, we've been targeting print and social media like Facebook with videos, podcasts, and ads that address discrimination and let people know how to report it. And thanks to Assist Assistant Secretary Mercedes Marquez, who's also here today, we've required grant applicants to comply with state and local anti-discrimination laws that include sexual orientation or gender discrimination, covering 20 states that more than four in 10 Americans call home. $3 billion in HUD funding is available in these grants. And we wanna make sure as many dollars as possible are protecting the rights of every American. These are the first steps we've taken to ensure that all Americans, regardless of age, income, race, ethnicity, gender, or sexual orientation or gender identity, have access to choice and opportunity. But I tell you today, they are far from the last. Just over a month ago, I was proud to stand before the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force's Creating Change Conference to announce a new equal access to housing rule that says clearly and unequivocally that LGBT individuals and couples have the right to live where they choose. And today, and today, I'm just as proud to tell all of you that the rule is now final and officially went into effect this very week. This is an idea whose time has come. And before I go into the rule itself, I want to acknowledge the third HUD Assistant Secretary here today, John Trasvina, and the rest of the entire HUD team for their extraordinary work to get it across the finish line. In fact, I'm not sure what work is going on in Washington, D.C. at HUD today, given how much of the team is, is here with us. 
But I'll tell you, it is a real demonstration of how important this issue is to me, to the president, to the admi entire administration. So let me tell you a little bit about the rule. First and foremost, it includes a new equal access provision that, that prohibits owners and operators of HUD-funded housing or housing whose financing we insure from inquiring about an applicant's sexual orientation or gender identity or denying housing on that basis. If you're denying HUD housing to people on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, actual or perceived, you're discriminating. You are breaking the law and you will be held accountable. That's what equal access means and that's what this rule is going to do. Secondly, the rule makes clear that LGBT families like the Deshanes are eligible for HUD's public housing and housing choice voucher programs that collectively serve five and a half million people. Third, the rule also makes clear that sexual orientation and gender identity should not and cannot be part of any lending decision when it comes to getting a mortgage insured by the FHA, which is part of HUD. When you think about the fact that a third of the people who bought homes in this country last year used an FHA mortgage, 60% of African Americans and Latinos, this is important. It will make a real difference in families' lives, in people's lives, when they're searching for a home to purchase. Now, I'm excited, as excited about this rule as everyone here, but let's be clear. Putting this rule on the books won't be the end of the process, but in many ways, it's just the beginning. Enacting a rule is not enough. Training and education are essential to ensuring rules are followed in communities across the country. And so HUD and its fair housing partners will work to provide guidance and training on the substance of this rule and the impact it will have for both how we administer HUD programs and how we enforce our nation's fair housing laws more broadly. And we look forward to working with partners like everyone here today on that education effort. All of this work reflects a few simple values, values that President Obama articulated in his State of the Union address. That America succeeds when everyone gets a fair shot, when everyone does their fair share, and when everyone plays by the same rules. Those values represent who we are and who we aspire to be. They are the values of people like Ruth Ellis, a woman whose own parents were born in the last days of slavery, but lived long enough to see the beginning of the gay rights movement. She lived with dignity, she lived with pride, and she lived with the hope that one day, even if she knew that she wouldn't be around to see it, a time would come when every American would have the chance to live where they choose, raise their families, and contribute to their communities, regardless of who they were or who they loved. I know we're not there yet, but I also know that by working together, all of us can realize Ruth Ellis's hope and create a stronger, fairer country for every American. I am so happy to have been with you today to have this opportunity to talk to you about the work that we're doing at HUD and across the Obama administration. Most importantly, I know that each and every one of you is committed to keep up this fight. Thank you for the work that you've already done. Thank you for the work that's ahead of us together. Thank you for having me here today.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Neil Coleman. I'm the Chief External Affairs Officer at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, and I'm here to moderate the panel of uh, senior administration leaders that we have um, for the next uh, 90 minutes. Um, just to run through how this panel will, will work, um, I'll give each of the panelists an opportunity to uh, introduce themselves. Um, then I will have a few questions for them. Um, and then we'll take questions from you. Um, and we'll do that by asking you to fill out uh, cards, which we'll collect in. Um, so if you want to start thinking about your questions now um, and over the course of the initial dialogue, um, then there will be people coming through the audience uh, to hand out cards and to, um, to take them in and pass them up to me. Um, so let me just start by giving a quick introduction of the panelists. Um, and then asking them to tell you just a little bit about themselves, their background, um, what they do now, and some of the things that they're working on that are of relevance for this audience. Um, so, sort of moving along the table here, um, Raphael Bostic, who's the Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research at HUD. Mercedes Marquez, who's the Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development, also at HUD. Um, then John Trasvina, who's HUD's Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. Um, then we have uh, U.S. Attorney uh, McQuaid, um, who is the uh, U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. And um, then we have Brian Samuels, who's the Commissioner of the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so let me give each of the panelists a chance to give a quick introduction. Um, I should note that all of these panelists were nominated um, by President Obama. Um, okay. Um, all of the panelists were nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate. Um, so let me give you uh, an opportunity to hear from them. Um, I'll start with uh, Raphael Bostic. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, good to be here in Detroit. It's good to see so many people here. And I have to say, you all should really uh, appreciate how significant uh, this panel is. I have sat with two other, uh, at, at least two other assistant secretaries from HUD outside of Washington, I think, twice. <laughs> and this is the third time. Mm -hmm. um, this is truly a remarkable thing. And it really does uh, demonstrate where uh, the department feels is on these issues and the importance that, that we attach to it. And uh, it's, I also have to say, we, we didn't give enough shout-outs shout to Sean. Um, mm -hmm. Our secretary is great. He is a wonderful person to work for. And uh, <laughs> yes. And, and you heard him say, um, that is wrong a lot in his speech, and uh, that he has so, he's so clear on when you've crossed the line and, and what it means to cross the line, it makes it very easy for us to do our jobs, and uh, he's just an inspiration, and I appreciate that. Uh, a, little about, a little about me, I'm from the East Coast, uh, but I've tra I'm transplanted. I call myself a Californian now. Um, we let him get away. I, uh, I, uh, uh, before I, I came to uh, Washington, I worked as a professor at the University of Southern California, working in, in public policy and housing and home ownership. I'm an economist by training. Um, at HUD, I uh, run the Office of Policy Development and Research, and the secretary talked about the study that we're doing. Um, I'll say a little bit about that. And uh, uh, Every 10 years, HUD does a study of housing discrimination uh, to determine and, and quantify how much discrimination there is out in the marketplace and what the practices and activities associated with that discrimination are. Um, we do it differently than, what, than how it usually is done in that we send paired testers out. So we send two people, uh, say if it was discrimination based on race, you might send uh, an African American woman and a Caucasian woman to the same house or the same apartment. They have the same script, the same resume, Everything is exactly the same, and then we just track how are they treated. And um, though, so when you see differences there, you know what it's about. Um, and so historically what we've done in terms of these studies is uh, just look at the 
the, the dimensions covered by the Fair Housing Act, and uh, gender identity and sexual orientation are not. Uh, this year, for the first time, this round for the first time, we decided we were going to go beyond that. And uh, we've conducted a, a study of housing discrimination and pair testing for same-sex couples. And uh, that started last summer. We have some preliminary results that are coming. Uh, I think I'm going to tell you a little bit about them right now, in fact. So um, the study looked at, uh, it's a national study, 50 metropolitan areas, and we had six, almost 7,000 matched pairs. So we had uh, a heterosexual couple and then a same-sex couple. Half of the same-sex couples were uh, female couples, half were male couples. What we saw was actually some, and, and we did this uh, for rental apartments using Craigslist. Right, so we just would send an email to the, the landlord or the property manager and say, you know, we're looking for an apartment. We saw you had a listing um, and waited to see what happened. What we saw was something actually quite interesting, which was that uh, same-sex couples were less likely to get favorable responses than the, the heterosexual couples. Uh, the, the significant metrics were, uh, were heterosexual versus same-sex male couples. Uh, when you looked at same-sex female couples, there were differences, but they weren't statistically significant, and that's sort of math geek stuff for me, but, uh, but there were differences. Uh, and the interesting piece was the, the significant differences were in whether you got a response back or not. If you got a response back, you got treated exactly the same. Uh, but it was whether they, they actually reached back out to you. Um, these are preliminary results. You should find uh, the, the full study coming out sometime in the summer. I'm pushing for sooner in the summer than later. Uh, but it, it is important, and, and Sean talked about how this is a really important thing to try to change the dialogue. Uh, we, we have worked as much as possible to make our policies evidence-based policy. And we don't have a lot of evidence on this, particularly at the national level. And being able to, to, to show in a clear statistical way <clears throat> that these differences, that this sort of discrimination exists, I think will go a long way to changing the, the conversation that we have and ultimately getting these uh, sorts of activities and, and behaviors uh, removed from our marketplace. Also, I should say one other thing. Um, I came out uh, about 20 years ago. Oh. We won't mention Don't, No one else call the numbers if you have to do that. Um, I have a partner of 17 years. Um, uh, he's still in California, which is another reason why I'm going to go back there eventually. But uh, it has been a, truly a pleasure uh, and really not an issue to serve in this administration as an out gay man. And um, again, that's a tribute to the president. And it really uh, indicates a significant change that we've had in Washington and across the country. So thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Um, Mercedes, maybe you want to introduce yourself and a little bit about what you're working on. Uh, good morning, everybody. Buenos dias. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I am, what I do now as Assistant Secretary is uh, deal with a lot of the block grant money that, the, that cities and communities get across the country. Um, but a lot of other things. In many ways, community planning and development is, a, is really a grouping of several individual businesses. So that uh, handle the CDBG program, the home program, uh, the uh, special needs program, so that's ESG and HAPWA as well. I'm responsible for the disaster dollars that we put out. That's about 30 billion that is in the portfolio right now. Um, the neighborhood stabilization program our economic development uh, areas, uh, rural grants. <laughs> um, there are actually a few other things. Um, it, really, it's about community development as a whole. And uh, what my pleasure is uh, to do at HUD is to try to bring integration of many of HUD's values uh, into these programs, right? Really trying to understand what does equity look like when you invest in it? 
uh, through these dollars. And so I think that in, in, in summary would be what I do. My background is actually as a civil rights litigator. So most of my career, that's what I've done, specializing in housing, uh, in housing discrimination actually, and in employment issues. Um, at, I didn't know this at the time, and I'm really glad that I didn't because we would have been incredibly nervous had we known. Um, but I was told after the fact um, that I'm the first con for me uh, to be confirmed while already in a legal same-sex marriage. Um, had she known that, she would have freaked out. <laughs> so, so my wife, Mirta, and I were um, among the 18,000 couples that were legally married in California. Uh, and I would have to say, uh, along with Rafael, that uh, I served in the Clinton administration. And the president, President Clinton was very supportive of LGBT issues, but it was a different time. Uh, and so I will tell you then, it was a bit dicey to be an out lesbian. I was, um, but it, it was a bit dicey. You know, things happened. Um, people said things. Uh, folks were uncomfortable. And we just made them uncomfortable, I guess, for the four years that we served. Um, you know, in Spanish you'd say, ni modo, too bad, right? Um, in this administration, it is a completely different feeling. Uh, I have never felt uh, uncomfortable. I have never felt uh, shy in any way about uh, who, who we are, how we do our work. Uh, and that is an incredibly welcoming way to bring all of you to something. Uh, right? When You all know that. When you can't bring all of you to something, you're, right, so you're never quite exactly more than the sum of all your parts. And this allows us to do that, and in, in HUD, no small measure because of who the secretary is. Um, we've been friends and colleagues for many, many years, uh, and he has exceeded all expectations on openness and on guts on this issue. And so I, I have to continue to give him his props for that. Um, here, we, we are trying, as it relates to these issues, as I said, to understand what equity looks like when you invest in it. And so we didn't have to have a conversation of, of HUD. We're so proud of the work that has been done on this new rule and on what John will talk to you about and what FHEO has led us uh, on this issue. But nobody had to say, so what are you all going to do to support it? We didn't have to have a meeting to talk about that. Everyone just went about their business of supporting it, right? And so it went into effect this week, and so immediately um, we had already, were waiting for the rule to be posted. So just this week on our listserv on all homeless issues are about 18,000 different organizations, uh, continuums of care that look at it. If you go on the listserv, you will see a letter from me talking about that the rule is now the law. Um, I've also sent uh, a letter to all of our grantees, that's over 1,200 grantees that receive CDBG or our block grant programs, telling them about the rule and a key sentence. Uh, As a new program regulation, failure to comply with the requirements of this rule will be considered a violation of program requirements and will, be subject, and will subject the non-compliant grantee to all sanctions and penalties available for program requirement violations. So while John and Fair Housing Groups will do all of the beautiful work they do across the country to make that clear, when the Assistant Secretary that controls your money tells you it's a violation of the law, to the mayor, those guys take a look. So <laughs> we're happy to be able to support FHEO's great work and HUD's great work and the administration's great work on this issue. So that's among the things. The Secretary's touched on how we have changed the definition under the Hearth Act uh, and how we've redefined youth. And that is incredibly important, right? The rule went in, the definition on, on homelessness went into effect in January, uh, and it does open it up. You know, among the issues that we don't want to perpetuate, uh, we don't want to have it be that a young person under 25 needs to prove that they're chronically homeless before they can get help, right? You want to stop that before they enter that cycle. And so changing that definition allows um, our young folks 
uh, to access so many other things. And so just that alone is a huge difference in homeless programs. We know there are other things, and we're committed to working on them. As a matter of fact, we spoke uh, with Nan Roman's group this uh, week in Washington, and we've agreed that this summer at their roundtable, we're going to host a roundtable on LGBT issues and housing in general, but on homeless youth in particular, uh, because we know there are still things that the, you know, we could do better, uh, some things that the rule couldn't get to. Um, as we're in this path. So we're all going to work together to, to figure that out. But from, from our point of view, um, that's what we're doing. I was also asked to say a little bit about our elders. Uh, and, you know, it is in our community, right? We know these things to be true, right? We know that sometimes our focus on youth um, kind of sets some assumptions and leaves out our elders. Right? There are also assumptions in our community nationally about how much money we make, about how much expendable income we have, and all those types of things, right? And you know, when you really look at it, particularly this generation of elders and the generation before, uh, it's not true about that income. Um, and for uh, women uh, or for uh, transgender folks identified as women, oh my, right? Either because they came out uh, in midlife and lost everything in doing so, right? Or because of the way they present, have been discriminated against from the get. And because women in general make less money than men, because that discrimination is still quite alive. Um, you add these other factors and they're in real trouble. So the need for elder housing um, is really uh, quite important. And the work that Rafael and his team have done with HHS on hosting that first conference, very, very important. Um, later in questions, we can talk about it. There's one, I think there's still, I, I'm sad to say, there's only, I think, one uh, project in the country that still specifically focuses on LGBT elders in California. It's in Los Angeles. It's called Triangle Square. And some of you may have seen it or heard about it, and I'm proud to tell you that I'm the developer of that project. I'm so happy to take questions about that as we go through how you really do it, how you use HUD dollars to do it, how you make it replicable, and how you actually speak to the real needs, hidden or not, that our community has. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mercedes. Next, um, Assistant Secretary John Trasvenia, who, um, as we were just mentioning, has been uh, spearheading the new LGBT equal access to housing rule that was finalized this week. John? Uh, thank you, Neil. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor uh, to be your Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, and it is an honor to work for a boss like Secretary Donovan, uh, who not only says to do what's right, he always says, well, what else are we going to do? What's the next step? And I think today we can focus on some of the next steps. Uh, but these issues are uh, critically important to this administration. And while you've asked to talk a little bit about our, our, our personal background, I don't have the same personal involvement as my, as my colleagues here. But as I look back on my uh, interest and commitment to public service, uh, one of the first jobs I had as a summer intern uh, was in the summer of 1978, uh, working for Mayor George Moscone. Uh, worked in the area of de dealing with the Board of Supervisors. So I saw Supervisor Milk on a daily basis. Supervisor Dan White I saw on a daily basis. And Harvey Milk was one who was our major champion on Latino issues at the Board of Supervisors. More so than even, I have to say, some of, some of, those, some of those who you would think would be more, more involved. Uh, and that is, that, that is the type of, of inspiration I've had in public service. So that, we, yes, we have a lot of LGBT colleagues in this administration. Some of them are working on trade issues. Some of them are working at Export and Import Bank. They're working on positions because they are experts in that area. And we have people working, like, as I am on this issue, not because of my background, but because it is of national importance front and center on the issues you cannot handle, you cannot meaningfully address fair housing in the 21st century without looking at the conditions of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people. When your own Senator Hart, back in 1968, he carried, he carried the Fair Housing Act through uh, the United States Senate in those days after Dr. King's assassination, 68. 
he talked about HUD being there for better housing, but also for fairer housing. And that's what this is about. That's what this is about uh, today. Uh, and as we look at, the, look at the Fair Housing Act in context, it has always been part of a reflection of where the nation spoke out about it in terms of equality. So we started out with race, religion, national origin, and color as part of the core provisions of the 68 Act. Took the women's liberation movement and, and more activism in the streets and in Washington to add gender to the law in 1975. The notions of how we, as a society, look at people with disabilities. More now focus on the abilities rather than on the disabilities. And it took another dozen years for the disability provisions and families with children provisions to be added uh, to the law in 1988. Uh, so as we look at, at these issues today, these are the 21st century issues of dealing with fair housing and equal opportunity. It's not to say that the issues of the past are, are, are just of the past. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of work to continue to do uh, in those areas as well. Uh, but I, I am proud to be able to uh, be here with you today. And, and, and Wayne State, again, growing up in my own uh, background, a farm worker advocacy, Wayne State was the place that stood for men and women, not just auto workers, farm workers. And this is the place. You have a proud history and tradition of looking at societal needs, social justice. So we picked a great place to be here, and we're very happy to be here with you. Uh, now Secretary Donovan talked a lot about the provisions of the rule, some of the reasons uh, behind it. Uh, now, one thing, that, one thing that is important to note is that uh, LGBT is not included in, in, in the Fair Housing Act in Title VIII. We, Congress has to act in order to make that happen. But we are not waiting for Congress to act. We are moving forward our own responsibilities as a pretty big landlord and all the housing programs. We are taking it on our own responsibilities to say that in HUD housing and in HUD assistant programs, you can't be excluding people based upon uh, being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or, tr or transgender. So you have the various provisions, making sure that the definition of family clarifies that it's 21st century families, a people ir irrespective of sexual orientation, gender identity, and marital status. That as you look at uh, the FHA insured uh, loans, one third of the new home buyers, one third of the new home buyers, you go to FHA, and 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 being LGBT is not a reason, not a basis to exclude someone from one of those loans uh, uh, under this rule. Beyond that, though, uh, because we we do have the limitations that this is so. This is not a typical matter of discrimination where you come to the Fair Housing Office. We want you to come to our office. But as, as, as Merced has noted, it's, we are treating this as a program rule. We still need, we still need Title VIII to be amended, but we're looking, we're looking at this as a program rule so that our, all, all of our offices, whether it's in public and Indian housing, for the public housing authorities, Merced's office, for some of the CDBG recipients, that we, we are working together. Get you in the door, in any, in any, any door through HUD, we will get you to the right place uh, to make sure that, that individuals who are excluded unfairly and, and, and illegally are, are, are protected. Uh, but we have made a lot of advancements. Ten years ago, only 2 percent of the country lived in a place where, where the, uh, where the uh, state or local laws uh, protected LGBT people against housing discrimination. Today, we're at 41 percent of the country of under those laws, and in, including, uh, th thanks to this week and the advocacy of many people in this room, uh, Flint, uh, being added to those families of cities. <laughs> So we are, we are marching forward on this. Uh, of course, the next step is to make sure that it's not just uh, sitting proudly and well in the Federal Register, but has meaning, has meaning throughout the country. So our next steps are to be working with you and, 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 and counterparts around the nation. Uh, Supervisor Milk used to say, it's that, it's that young person in Altoona, Pennsylvania, who has to have that hope, has to have that understanding. So without the individuals around the country knowing what their rights are, and without housing providers knowing what their responsibilities are, this rule will only exist in the Federal Register. So we are providing uh, educational materials and, 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 and other workshops. We will have this as our uh, uh, subject of our policy conference uh, in, in, in September, uh, a, a wide variety of educational materials and outreach to make sure uh, that this rule is a rule that serves all the people in, in, throughout the nation. Uh, there are some other issues that we can talk about later on in, uh, later on in the workshops about how the, the interplay between the federal law and the state of local laws 
but also the, 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 the important provision of making sure that uh, those who do discriminate are not eligible for HUD discretionary funds. So uh, we will continue to work with you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And yes, we have a lot of work to do, but we're going to get this done. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, as Raphael mentioned, it's, it's uh, very rare to have three HUD assistant secretaries all on one panel. But these issues of housing and homelessness obviously go beyond HUD. And that's why I'm pleased that it's not just uh, HUD uh, folks on this panel today. And so with that, um, let me introduce Barbara McQuaid, who's the US attorney for the uh, Eastern District of Michigan. Barbara? Good morning. And as uh, the only Detroit uh, panelist, I am very honored to be among <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm, I'm very, I was not looking for the cheap applause line, but thank you for that anyway. Um, I, I just wanted to say how honored I am uh, to be among all these distinguished visitors uh, from Washington. I am so pleased that the White House and the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Health and Human Services has seen fit to focus on this issue and focus on this issue in Detroit. We're, we're very honored. And it's days like this that encourage me that we truly are moving toward a more perfect union. Um, you hear the stories that we heard from Assistant Secretary uh, about what it was like just in the Clinton administration not so long ago. And when I hear your stories about the discrimination that occurs today, doesn't it feel like you're looking back on history from the future? Like, really? That really still goes on today? And so we still have more work to do, uh, but it's so encouraging to have the kind of focus and the kind of people uh, focusing on these issues. Um, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I've been uh, honored to be the U.S. Attorney since 2010, uh, born in Detroit, lifelong resident of Michigan, and a career prosecutor. And when I got this job, what I really wanted to do with the job is to use the resources of the U.S. Attorney's Office to improve the lives of the people who live here in Michigan. Um, and, and as Attorney General Holder likes to say, not to just be case processors, to do whatever comes in the door, but to be community problem solvers, to really look at what are the issues that matter to our people and use the tools of the U.S. Attorney's Office to focus on those issues. And one incredibly important issue is civil rights. So I created the office's first ever civil rights unit. Oh, another cheap applause line, thank you. But that unit has been doing some very important work, including in the LGBT context. Um, you know, doesn't it seem that here in Michigan, one of the goals ought to be to be a beacon to the world, to attract people to our community? Don't we want to be welcoming to all people, to immigrants, to gays and lesbians? Isn't that the kind of place we want to be, where we're, we're welcoming to people? So by protecting people's civil rights in a very proactive way, I hope we are sending that message. And we've done some things here that I'm very proud of. We enforce the Fair Housing Act. Uh, which includes provisions to protect people who are HIV positive. We uh, enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has, again, provisions to uh, protect people with HIV, and we have litigated such cases I'm very uh, proud of. Um, in this district, we also defended uh, the constitutional challenge to the Shepherd Bird Hate Crimes Prevention Act. You heard Secretary Donovan talk about that. That law was enacted shortly after President Obama took office. It is uh, a hate crimes bill that protects uh, people from assaults based on sexual orientation. Seems like a pretty basic concept. But before the ink was dry, a challenge was filed uh, challenging the constitutionality of that law. And it was filed right here in Michigan in Bay City. And uh, this is pure speculation on my part, but I think it was probably no coincidence that of all the places in America where you could file that lawsuit, it was filed in Bay City where there's only one judge who happened to be an appointee of President Bush perhaps looking for a, a, a hospital forum uh, where they thought they might get a favorable ruling. But I was very proud of the work that our office did and very proud that the judge there, Judge Ludington, followed the law and the Constitution and upheld the constitutionality of the Shepherd Bird Act. But uh, it's important to be proactive, so we've gotten out quite a bit and tried to work with groups like Equality Michigan, like the Ruth Ellis Center, to talk about some of the things that we can do, because people need to know we're here and need to know uh, that we're here to protect and enforce people's rights. We set up a civil rights hotline, that number, if you have a pen, 313-226-9151, that's 
9151. You can also find it on our website if you simply Google U.S. Attorney Eastern Michigan. You can find it as well. But we get a lot of uh, civil rights referrals through that hotline, so I want to make sure you're aware of it. But we try to get out and raise awareness of the civil rights enforcement that we have. And in particular, um, the issue of bullying of young people, I think, is an important issue because it is so closely tied to this issue of homelessness for youth, of uh, teen suicide, of the kinds of, uh, of things that teens face. We have seen cases involving uh, young people who are bullied so often for gender nonconformity. In fact, recently in Minnesota, uh, the Ju Justice Department uh, obtained a consent decree uh, against a school district where young people were being discriminated based on gender nonconformity. And the result is that policies have now been implemented in that school district to prevent, detect, and disrupt bullying so that it won't occur again. And those kids can go in and enjoy the kind of education that all of us should have the right to. And here in Michigan, we've been trying to do a lot of outreach to schools and community groups to raise their awareness of the bullying issue and the enforcement remedies that we have available here at the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I share that with you so that you can help us spread the word about the kinds of enforcement remedies that are available to people. So I thank you. I thank you all for your interest in this issue. And I thank all of the, the panelists for being here and the important work that they're doing. Thank you, Barbara. Um, one of the powerful uh, collaborations within the Obama administration has been between, uh, on LGBT issues, has been between HUD and the Department of Health and Human Services. And so I'm very pleased that we have here with us today Commissioner um, Brian Samuels from the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. Great, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, while I probably can't claim having worked for HUD, um, <laughs> or being from uh, Detroit, I am sm part of a small group of folks that have picked up their roots in Chicago and moved to DC um, and can claim that I'm the, probably the only person on this panel that can say that the president worked for me. <laughs> uh, 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 the, the president was, uh, was both uh, my uh, state senator as well as my uh, U.S. senator, and I had the opportunity to work with him uh, when I was the state child welfare director and he was the uh, state senator. Uh, and so it's been a real pleasure and honor to be able to come to D.C. and provide what support I can to move an agenda um, that I think uh, um, is a lifetime a unique lifetime opportunity. And so uh, the work that I do here or in DC, I think is only a very small piece of the federal government, but it's one that I'm proud to be a part of helping to move. So again, um, at the Administration for Children, Youth, and Families, I'm responsible for both um, all of the resources that um, funnel from the federal government to states related to child welfare. So both the um, abuse and neglect prevention funds, as well as all of the funding that supports state systems. Uh, we also provide um, oversight and regulatory functions uh, for those state child welfare agencies also. And in addition to that, I'm responsible for um, all of the programs around the runaway and homeless youth population. Uh, we provide funding supporting domestic violence shelters and support services. Uh, as well as a portfolio of teen pregnancy prevention programs. Uh, and so it's really in that context that I'm here today to talk some about the work that we've been doing. Um, at HHS, I've gotten uh, incredible support from the secretary around moving LGBT issues, uh, really, and moving them in a manner um, that is opportunistic. We're looking for every opportunity possible uh, to make the world make a little more sense for, for this group of young people. Uh, and so uh, Secretary Sebelius has been um, a great champion and has made my job a lot easier um, to do. Um, but in many respects, when I look at the young people who are in the child welfare system that are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, and I look at the young people who are living on the streets today um, with the same orientation, um, the reality is, is we're not talking about two different groups of young people. We're talking about the same young people um, the only difference between those that are being served in the child welfare system and those that are being served on the streets of this country 
um, is that they had different routes out of their homes. And so at the administration, we're really trying to build that bridge across the child welfare system and the runway and homeless youth system. So we're looking at these young people as they are and as one population and really trying to take advantage of all of the funding opportunities and regulatory opportunities we have available to us to make this world make a little more sense for all of them. And so I'll talk you through some of the things that we're doing that we think are important. On the regulatory side, we're in the process of writing the regulations around um, all of the programs that support the runaway and homeless youth population. So we're writing the regulations that will serve for, as guidance for all of our shelters, all of our street outreach programs, all of our teen, I'm sorry, and all of our um, transitional living programs. Uh, and through that regulatory process, we'll be making sure that we protect the rights of the LGBT and Q um, population. At the same time, we're using all of the child welfare regulations to remind states their obligation to serve these young people uh, in an appropriate way and to be striving for the same outcomes and results for them as we are for all of the other children in the foster care system. Um, one of the um, unique changes that's gone on in the child welfare system over the last 15 years, if you've seen a significant reduction in the overall population, that's largely a function of federal policy with a good deal of work done at the state level, but the child welfare system today is about 30% smaller than it was uh, 14 years ago. Um, and it's really in that context that then um, you can really um, begin to see um, the failure of that system to meet the needs of the LGBTQ population, right? When you've got lots of kids and lots of families and things, you're, you're looking for any bed to make sure that any child doesn't sleep uh, in the wrong uh, environment. Uh, it's easy to lose track of all of those subpopulations of young people who have a unique set of needs. But as the systems have gotten smaller, it's become more apparent to everyone that the systems are really failing to meet the needs of these young people. And so we're really trying to drive home to states um, that this is their work. This is the work of the future, just as um, uh, we've seen reductions in the number of African Americans in the child welfare system. Uh, we're looking to states to reduce um, the number of LGBT and Q um, youth who are in the child welfare system um, so that they benefit in the same way that other children and families have. So from a regulatory standpoint, we're certainly trying to push um, focusing on this population and making sure that we get it right. Um, in addition to that, um, we're working across all of our funding announcements to make sure that the LGBTQ population is uh, right in the center of that focus. So for example, um, the, the process of reviewing and funding grants related to the street outreach pro program, the runaway and homeless youth shelters, as well as the transitional living pro programs, we're making explicit that this population ought to be a target for, for those applications. So we're looking to folks to describe how they would specifically propose to serve this population better. And everywhere where we can find strong programs, strong um, responses to those announcements, uh, we're making funding decisions to make sure that this population's needs are met. Um, we've also uh, raised the visibility of this population in the context of, um, of other funding programs like, uh, we put $15 million into an initiative in LA um, to target specifically the LGBTQ population within the child welfare system, identifying them early, serving them directly, and hopefully reducing the amount of time that they spend in the foster care system. Uh, that $15 million will go both to train um, staff in private agencies as well as countywide staff, um, but it will also be used to put together a unique combination of services and supports for this population with the hope that if we can demonstrate progress there, um, we'll have a model that we can then replicate in other child welfare systems uh, across the country. We're also making grants to um, states to ensure that we have foster parents and respite parent support or for the population. So we're doing outreach specifically to the gay and lesbian community to both recruit foster parents um, as well as provide additional supports to foster parents who are parenting LGBTQ um, youth. 
Um, in addition to that, um, in all of our funding announcements related to teen pregnancy prevention, we're making clear that the LGBTQ population ought to have their needs addressed in those funding opportunities also. So you'll see um, both proposals that specifically target this population and design programs around them, uh, and in other instances you see um, programs that are committed to training and monitoring their interactions so that they have a culturally sensitive approach to meeting the needs of this population. So I think in those as examples, there are more that I could give. I, I think w the message that I'm trying to send is one that says that we, we get it and we're making sure that from a regulatory standpoint, we're making sure that the needs are being met and addressed. But we're also looking for every other funding opportunity to make sure the community has the resources it needs uh, to demonstrate that we can both serve this population well and we can get better results for these young people. So, thanks. Thank you. We'll now move to questions. Um, there are cards for you to write and submit your questions. Hold up your hand if you uh, would like to uh, get a card and we'll collect them in. Um, I will ask a few questions um, just quickly. Um, to give a little bit of time for you all to, to collect your thoughts and, and submit your cards. Um, so maybe starting with uh, Raphael, um, Mercedes talked a little bit about um, uh, focusing on um, LGBT seniors, and I know this is something that you've been working on as well with a um, historic summit that HUD and HHS uh, did in December of last year. Um, so maybe you'd like to talk just a little bit more about that work? Sure, um, and as the background for this, uh, one of the things I do is, we all do, is go around the country talking to people to try to understand what the issues are on the ground. And one of the issues that's come up, that came up repeatedly for me as I was uh, talking to, to folks in various cities is that we have a, a growing LGBT elder population. Um, if you think about Stonewall and the timing of this, we just haven't had a long history of out LGBT people um, so that they could become seniors, and we're now at a place where that's increasing a lot, and there, isn't a, there hadn't been a lot of conversation or policy around it, and Mercedes noted we have one, one project that is catered to those very special needs. So uh, we decided we, we should try to get people to talk about it and start to create a community around LGBT elders. And I should say, uh, one, of the, one of the groups that I talked to was Curtis Lipscomb here in Detroit, um, they had an LGBT elder summit for African American uh, populations, which I think may have been the first one ever. Um, uh, so it, it was actually one of the, the real motivations for that. We did this uh, right around Christmas, a little before Christmas. It was a really good Christmas present for me. Um, uh, and we had 100 people from around the country come and spend a day talking about LGBT elder issues. Uh, not only the issues, but some of the challenges and how you would try to develop housing tailored to those populations and create the support systems that are necessary. Um, if you go to our website, um, my group's website is huduser.org, there should be material up there that talks about some of the things that were discussed at this conference. Uh, and it is definitely food for thought. And, and one of the things I should just really emphasize is that this is a, this is a new area. Uh, for policy and for uh, for housing work, and so if you have passions in this, don't think that's already been done because it hasn't. Uh, and it's really uh, an opportunity for people to step forward and take leadership and make a difference uh, for a wave of people who is coming down the pike um, that is going to be looking for support and help. Thank you. Mercedes, you talked a little bit about your work as a developer, and obviously you have both the local um, and national government experience. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about some advice for LGBT organizations on the local level about accessing funding and, and getting help from, um, from HUD. Sure. I'd say the most important thing to do, uh, certainly at the local level, is make yourself known. Right. If these are your, you know, 
if you have to get out of the comfort zone of who you usually deal with and, and uh, what entities you usually receive funding from, right? So that if you have an interest uh, in housing, for instance, but you do, but you, but your expertise is really in a particular population, whether it's youth or elders. I'd say one of the most important things is you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. You don't have to become the expert in building housing. And oftentimes we're so used to being isolated that we think we have to do it all, and we really don't. So an important thing uh, is to reach out to another uh, strong nonprofit or for-profit. Uh, that does affordable housing, um, that you could partner with. The, so you bring to that partnership the expertise you have on the particular populations, the services they need, all those other things, but partner with them on the expertise they have uh, in an area that you don't, but you want to break into. And that's certainly something on elder housing is you don't have to do it alone. Um, the other thing I would say is that as you then do that, go forward uh, to those agencies that don't know you and do a complete uh, introduction of what you do so that they have a sense that they can rely on you because it's probably also true uh, that in every housing department across the country they don't have a good connect to the LGBT community either right and getting to know you will give them somebody to start to, to really talk to and and learn about that's important and then finally I'd say um, on that as you want to get involved in housing um, important to learn those programs Right, and there are lots of ways to do that. Uh, HUD certainly uh, could help train you. My office could do that. Uh, to understand the use of the programs and how they integrate together so that you get a, a meaningful understanding of it. Um, it may be that you receive CDBG dollars for a particular service um, that you do, and so you know the rules from that perspective, but not from the perspective of some other new business line that you'd like to introduce. Um, those are the things. The other thing I'd say to you, very important to focus on replicability, right? Federal dollars and program requirements really do push us towards those things that already work. Uh, and um, one of the things that I learned in doing Triangle Square and building it is that when f f folks first wanted to talk about this, um, I went to San Francisco where I'm, John and I are both natives of San Francisco, and um, I was up there because they were trying to get this done. And they laid out for me, I mean, everything under the sun that they wanted to do, right? It would have all kinds of stuff, all important to an aging LGBT uh, member, but not something that was replicable, right? Very hard to put together. And we're, at that point, not so willing to let go of that big dream. And what ended up happening is that in Los Angeles, we designed it, we started a nonprofit, Right, <laughs> focused only on LGBT elder housing issues. Um, they then started a nonprofit on services for them. We got it built, we found the land, we got it financed, we had everybody there. And after the conference that Rafael sponsored at HUD, the same woman in San Francisco that talked to me 10 years ago still came to talk to me and still hasn't done it. Right, almost there but because unwilling to let go of the issue of replicability. So that's what I would say, focus in on those things. Because now that Triangle Square is done, we've learned an awful lot, there's a lot to teach, right? So don't give up the really good for the, you know, perfect. Thank you. Um, John, both you and Secretary Donovan spoke um, about the new rule, um, but I think one of the interesting things in, in its development was the role that advocates played in the consultation process. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that and also the role that, that um, they can play in the implementation going forward. Yes, Neil, this, this rule, uh, while it comes officially from, from HUD and it's in the Federal Register, it really, it came about from experiences from people around the country. And we, we did a number of, Raphael and I did a number of workshops around the country. And uh, it was important that we're not, not only in places where you think, oh, well, it's an organized community, let's go to Boston, Chicago, New York, San Francisco. We were in Spokane, Washington, uh, because our career HUD staff said, this is an important issue out here, too, and it would be an important message to the people in eastern Washington and Idaho and Oregon to have a federal agency spend an afternoon talking about LGBT discrimination issues. So we were there as well, and that's where we met Mitch and Michelle DeShane. Uh, but, the, but overall, in terms of, in terms of the of how best, best approaching the issue, how to uh, 
make sure that we were not inadvertently implementing Title VIII before we have no authority uh, in, on LGBT because Congress hasn't, hasn't taken it up. Uh, we, work, we work very closely with uh, uh, National Center for Lesbian Rights. I see Maya Rupert here and the Center for Transgender Equality and other organizations of being able to bring in the community perspective as well as how um, in real life uh, the, the needs of the community could, could best be addressed. Uh, move, moving uh, forward, uh, we have we have been able to be, be with a number of different organizations to help us get the word out as to uh, the, the 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 importance of of the issue and and that uh, there is a federal agency that will address these concerns. Uh, so, for example, on 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 the the, the difference between Title VIII and 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 this rule, uh, while this rule is clear that it's a program rule, uh, we are in the past we said if there was an LGBT housing concern. We would say, well, Title VIII precludes us from getting involved. Uh, in, under this administration, we are welcoming calls and inquiries, and oftentimes we don't expect we don't expect individuals or families who are facing housing discrimination to be experts in federal law. They tell us that it's a, that, uh, of this fact pattern. It could very well be if if somebody is being discriminated against because uh, there's perception that they have AIDS. That's not necessarily an LGBT housing discrimination could become under the disability provisions of the Fair Housing Act. Or uh, other provisions could be, could be under the gender uh, provisions. The gender identity issues are increasingly looked at at courts as gender, gender identity and gender discrimination. So we welcome the calls and, and really it is indispensable to have uh, advocates and community organizations to help us spread, help us spread the word. Uh, been out to a lot, of the, a lot of the community centers who want to continue to do that. Uh, we have a lot of uh, outreach materials uh, that it makes sense to be able to work work with you as trusted institutions and leaders in the communities uh, to help bridge the gap between Washington and, 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 and people throughout the country. Thank you, John. So um, questions are coming up, and I actually have one that's uh, suitable for you, Barbara, so I'll, I'll, I'll move to the audience questions. Um, given the disproportionate representation of LGBT youth in the juvenile justice system, many of whom are are or were homeless and are engaged in survival crimes or are simply profiled, is there any work being done with law enforcement agencies to stop this cycle? Uh, y yes, and there's um, some very good training that is beginning to occur, a little, a little late to the game, I'm afraid. But um, in fact, this morning at my office, there was a program going on with uh, a wonderful group called Advocates and Leaders for Police and Community Trust that gets together with law enforcement and community groups, including civil rights groups, to address these kinds of issues. Uh, but there are statistics that talk about the mistreatment of not only um, gay youth, but uh, transgender individuals are the group most likely to be mistreated by police. Uh, so I think it is an issue that is coming to law enforcement a little late to the game, but it is being addressed, particularly in Michigan. There's a group that f focuses on education standards for law enforcement, and dealing with people in the LGBT community is one that is now being part of the training that is going on with police. So it's, um, we're not there yet, but I think it is improving. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Sanders, question for you. Um, what are some specific measures being taken to stop discriminatory actions occurring in the foster care system? For example, foster parents refusing to house LGBT youth. Sure, great question. Um, you know, I think the, the important place to start in answering that question is just to, again, to, to recognize that if you find yourself in the foster care system or runaway and homeless youth, uh, odds are you've experienced, you know, some of the greatest uh, interpersonal sense of rejection that you can imagine, right? And so when you think about um, how you get to well-being for these young people, how do you get them to a place where they're healthy and they recognize that they have a really important contribution to the world, um, it, it really is uh, through these systems that we've set up, the child welfare system and the runaway and homeless youth. Um, and so really what we've tried to do is to shape the policy making as well as the funding environment for all of these programs. So for example, um, we sent out uh, a memorandum um, to all of the state child welfare agencies delineating what their obligation was to this population um, as well as to articulate the full range of technical assistance and support that we could provide to states so that they could 
put in place policies and programs that meet the needs of these young people and protect their rights. Um, in addition to that, we have been working with a small number of nonprofit organizations that do training um, around gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered youth, um, and really focused that work on using the funding available through child welfare training dollars to really begin to train child welfare agencies in how they recognize the needs of this population as well as meet the needs of this population. Um, again, in addition to that, we're going through the regulatory process as we speak to really lay out the standards for performance um, that would apply to all of the programs that we operate in the homeless um, arena. Uh, and as we go through that process, um, we're making sure that we are protecting um, the rights of this population uh, in every instance, as well as um, identifying where the runaway and homeless youth population, I mean, sorry, sorry the runaway and homeless youth programs uh, can do more than they're currently doing. Um, so where there's authority for us to intervene for this population, we are, uh, and where there are opportunities to educate folks about doing their work differently, um, we're doing that too. Thank you. Um, I'm going to direct this next uh, question first to Mercedes, but if the others uh, on the panel want to, to add, they certainly should. Um, what kind of education is happening for state and local officials from HUD to teach about particular issues faced by younger and elder, elder LGBT people seeking housing? Or does that education matter? The education does matter. Um, I'd say the way um, what we're attempting to do is, is this. It is difficult and, and some would say maybe not the best strategy, to only focus in on kind of individual groups as you're doing this training, right? I'd said earlier that what we were attempting to do was invest in equity, right? Invest in equity, because what, you know, you'll let me know if you disagree, um, but part of what we want to do is not continue to plan in a way and educate it in a way that isolates our community from any other community, right? I mean, part of what we're trying to do is integrate, right? So it's the same issue as we deal um, with, with HIV AIDS now. We've come a long way, and so oftentimes the desire of, of folks uh, living and, and thriving with this, you know, in their life with even while facing this disease is such that they no longer need um, just to be isolated in care and to be identified. They want to be integrated into the whole, right? Things have changed. So what we're doing uh, is something um, that will actually launch at the end of April. Uh, we are launching a brand new, what it's called, the Consolidated Plan. And anybody who has ever tried to testify before a city council on their use of CDBG or HOME or ESG or HOPWA funds knows that all communities, so 1,200, file these plans every five years and an update every year about how they're going to make their investments. So one thing that we've been doing, and I've been doing a lot here with my good friend Raphael, um, you should know Ruffin have been friends for many, many years, so we just kind of like, oh, here we are again. Um, we're working together uh, to ensure that the right data is now reaching, so that when folks are doing a plan, we're giving them better data on all kinds of things, right? Not just housing conditions, but on all kinds of demographics, public housing, employment, you name it, we're giving it to them. We're giving them the first mandatory template that has to be filled out. So the questions like the one that you're raising, whoever raised it in the, in the audience, has to be referred to now. And we're giving mapping tools. Only about a third of our communities have mapping capability. And now we're giving it to everybody. So it will all be web-based. Anybody in the community that wants to be involved on how these dollars are now spent, how equity is actually achieved through investment, will have the opportunity. All the data will be web-based. The mapping is web-based. We're going to do uh, grand training for everybody in the community on it. And every single consolidated plan in the country will be on the web and now searchable. So what we've really been able to do is democratize the data and give a greater voice to community. These are the kinds of ways that this is going to happen. So it won't just be LGBT issues. It'll be all kinds of issues that are looked at within a neighborhood and allow us to move forward on equity, but without needing to isolate ourselves. And, and Neil, um, uh, 
when you talk about education partnerships, I tend to filibuster, so don't let me do that. Uh, but we have the, the FIP and the FAP program within Fair Housing. The FIPS, and we have a very, very strong one out in Western Michigan and, and elsewhere in this state. It's a Fair Housing Initiatives program. Uh, they are the 120 Fair Housing Councils, legal aid organizations, and other private nonprofit groups around the country who are who were able to, we are able to support through HUD funding, uh, but they are out in communities working, educating people, helping us enforce the law. When, when people go to them, they get tremendous service and they're able to help uh, bring out, bring, uh, do some of the inter initial investigations uh, of, of our cases. Uh, and then able, and they, sometimes they bring cases on, on their own, sometimes they bring their cases, our cases to us. Also, the FAP program, which is the Fair, Fair Housing Assistance Program, that's the 98 state and local uh, civil rights agencies, state and local government civil rights agencies, uh, where, there is a, a, where there is a law that's similar to the federal uh, government's law on fair housing. And there again, uh, our, our enforcement is done uh, through them in many places, including here in the state of Michigan. Recently, we were able to uh, fund about uh, about seven and a half million dollars. Twenty percent of that money is going into projects to help educate people on this rule. So we're working very closely with the uh, National Center for Lesbian Rights as well as the state agencies in order to make sure that the word gets out, people are educated and informed about what this rule is. Uh, so the, the the FIP and the FAP here in in, in uh, uh, Michigan are critically important to this effort. Um, so this next question, I'll maybe start with um, John, but Barbara, maybe you want to weigh in as well. Um, please talk more about the enforcement of the new rule. The problem with local ordinances is the lack of real penalties for discrimination. Is this rule supported by strong enforcement? Uh, this rule, in its uh, this rule, is now four days old, uh, and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. it, we have the the advance uh, commitment of my colleagues, uh, both, both Mercedes, also Assistant Secretary Sandy Enriquez, who is our Assistant Secretary for Public and Indian Housing. Uh, in contrast to Title VIII, which comes strictly to the Fair Housing uh, Office, uh, this is a program rule. There, that means that when there is a violation, when we hear about it, uh, when people come to us, uh, our different office will investigate it than, than, is, than is traditionally the case on Fair Housing, but we will work very closely with them. And it, it, it will be a responsibility of, of the grantee uh, to comply with that, to comply with those rules. And, and this issue has come up in other places. There is no religious exemption uh, for, for, the, for this provision of law. If you're a recipient of HUD funds, if you're an entitlement community, a lo local government, if you are uh, in, in, in the Section 8 program, you are covered by this. So by, by virtue of being a HUD grantee, you're covered by this, by this uh, rule. Uh, and we will take it up at the local level, at the federal level, uh, to make sure that, uh, that these rights are protected. Yeah, and I'll just add that I think this rule is a big deal, um, and here's why. The uh, Fair Housing Act, which is passed by Congress, protects the rights of a lot of different kinds of people, but excluded from the protection is people who are discriminated against based on sexual orientation. It takes an act of Congress. I mean, my gosh, we can't even get a budget out of these people, let alone you know <laughs> something uh, as, as important and progressive as this issue. But I really applaud the administration, who is not waiting around for Congress to uh, focus on the right issues. And, and the administration has done this in other contexts as well, national security, um, we, we saw the issue with, with birth control recently, and, and now this issue, not waiting around for Congress, um, using the executive branch, which is a powerful branch of government, to make real change. And so I really applaud the work. So um, this has been a gap in the Fair Housing uh, uh, Act, and so I'm really pleased to see HUD take this on uh, so that this will be the rule of law in America. Thank you. Uh, this next one's for, oh. Sorry. So, I don't know if Mercedes was going to talk, but in her presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, she read a line from the letter that went to the grantees saying, you do this or you lose your money. Um, you should know that Mercedes doesn't play, right? <laughs> and so, so everybody who's reading that letter is going to get the message that this is serious and is something that people have got to pay attention to. 